Ending a 1,000-year standoff between the Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches, Pope Francis met Patriarch Kirill to sign a joint declaration on Friday, February the 12th. The words of the declaration speak for themselves. We give thanks to God, glorified in the Trinity, for this meeting, the first in history. It is with joy that we have met like brothers in the Christian faith who encountered one another to speak face to face, from heart to heart, to discuss the mutual relations between the churches, the crucial problems of our faithful, and the outlook for the progress of human civilization. End quote. The significance of this meeting, both historically and prophetically, cannot be underscored enough. Based on the prophecies throughout the scripture, Bible students have been anticipating this move for hundreds of years. The Orthodox and Catholic churches are destined by prophecy to be reunited and to work together. The picture of Daniel 2 sees the image with both its eastern and western legs united and standing on the mountains of Israel. As you read in Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through to verse 35, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. The great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee. The form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands that smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broke into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, the image stands complete on the mountains of Israel together, where it is destroyed. This requires the combining of all the composite elements into one unified body of flesh. East and West, though divided for 1,000 years, must reunite. This is the picture of Daniel 11, when the king of the north, headed by Rosh or Russia of Ezekiel 38, comes down like a whirlwind. We read in verse 41, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. He ends up establishing himself upon Mount Zion. We read in verse 45, He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. The prophecy of Daniel is echoed in the words of Isaiah 14, where a proverb is taken up against the king of Babylon. Remember, the head of gold of the image was Babylon. We read in verse 11, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread unto thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? Thou which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be broken, thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the heavens to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? Well, Russia's desire to ascend to the heavens is to be short-lived, for he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. However, he isn't alone in this ambition. The joint image includes both the Eastern, or Russian, and the Western, or Roman, elements. Isaiah asks, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? Well, the Apostle Paul picks up on these prophecies when he comments in 2 Thessalonians 2 of the same man. He says in verse 3, 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, this man of sin, or the falling away of the Christian apostasy, is enthroned in Rome and has the same ambition to sit in the temple of God in Jerusalem. And his fate, notice, is the same. Verse 8, Then shall that wicked be revealed, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. It is for this reason the events of the past week are so significant. The Eastern and, re and Western religious elements have been divided, perpetuating the political division between the legs of the image. The meeting of the Pope and the Patriarch heralds the coming together of the two composite parts. Out of their meeting came a clear declaration or a great voice, which focused on the need to be involved militarily in the Middle East. What brought the Pope and the Patriarch together after a thousand years of division? Well, the Declaration clearly spells out the common cause. The Pope and the Patriarch jointly stated, Our gaze must firstly turn to those regions of the world where Christians are victims of persecution. In many countries of the Middle East and North Africa, whole families, villages, villages and cities of our brothers and sisters in Christ are being completely exterminated. Their churches are being barbarously ravaged and looted. Their sacred objects profaned. Their monuments destroyed. It is with pain that we call to mind the situation in Syria, Iraq, and other countries of the Middle East, and the massive exodus of Christians from the land in which our faith was first disseminated, and in which they have lived since the time of the Apostles, together with other religious communities." End quote. Well, the goal of the Declaration wasn't just to draw attention to the problem, but to call for international action in the Middle East. He continues, We call upon the international community to act urgently in order to prevent the further expulsion of Christians from the Middle East. In raising our voice in defense of persecuted Christians, we wish to express our compassion for the suffering experienced by the faithful of other religious traditions who have also become victims of civil wars, chaos, and terrorist violence. Thousands of victims have already been claimed in the violence of Syria and Iraq, which has left many other millions without a home or means of sustenance. We urge the international community to seek an end to the violence and terrorism, and at the same time to contribute through dialogue to a swift return to the civil peace. Large-scale humanitarian aid must be assured to the afflicted populations and to the many refugees seeking safety in neighboring lands. End quote. Well, this is nothing short of a call for a holy crusade to the Holy Land to save Christianity. The words are pretty clear. And the declaration continues, the international community must undertake every possible effort to end terrorism through common, joint, and coordinated action. We call on all the countries involved in the struggle against terrorism to responsible and prudent action. We exhort all Christians and all believers of God to pray fervently to the providential creator of the world to protect his creation from destruction and not permit a new world war. In order to ensure a solid and enduring peace, specific efforts must be undertaken to recover the common values uniting us based on the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. Notice the amount of times the word action was used. A united, joint, coordinated action is being requested by both Pope and Patriarch in the Middle East. Well, who would lead such an enterprise to save Christianity from the infidels in the Middle East? Well, the Joint Declaration points to Russia as an example of moral strength, stating, in affirming the foremost value of religious freedom, we give thanks to God for the current unprecedented renewal of the Christian faith in Russia, as well as in many other countries of Eastern Europe, formerly dominated for decades by atheistic regimes. 
Today, the chains of militant atheism have been broken, and in many places, Christians can now freely confess their faith. Thousands of new churches have been built over the last quarter of a century, as well as hundreds of monasteries and theological institutions. Christian communities undertake notable works in the fields of charitable aid and social development, providing diversified forms of assistance to the needy. Orthodox and Catholics often work side by side. End quote. So, According to the Pope and the Patriarch, Russia is a model country going through a religious revival. Well, the newspaper Sputnik carried the headline, Pope Francis sees Putin as only man to defend Christians around the world. The article, published on February the 9th, stated, In an attempt to defend Christians in the Middle East and in other parts of the world where they've been persecuted, Pope Francis wants to ask Russian President Vladimir Putin for help. According to Pope Francis, Putin is the only man with whom the Catholic Church can unite to defend Christians in the Middle East. It's important to joint efforts with Russia to save Christianity in all regions of the world where it's oppressed, Pope Francis said, as cited by Le Journal du Dimanche. End quote. Amazing. Russia is identified by Pope and Patriarch as model country, undergoing a religious revival, and its leader, Vladimir Putin, is seen as the champion of Christianity. Not since the days of the Tsars has a Russian leader interested himself so much in the Orthodox Church. Putin has combined church and state as a propaganda tool for his own use. Putin was secretly baptized as a child by his devout Eastern Orthodox mother. In an interview outside the Church of the Holy Martyrs Alexander and Antonia of Rome, Putin spoke about this event. He said, This cathedral is special for me. I was baptized here about a month and a half after I was born, and my family lived near here. My mother told me that when she and a neighbor brought me here to be baptized, they did it in secret from my father, who was a member of the Communist Party and a loyal and uncompromising man. When I was brought to the church, the priest who baptized me said that it was the day of Archangel Michael. And, by the way, he added, My name is also Michael. So, you can give this name to the child if he hasn't already been named. But my mother said that he had already registered me as Vladimir, in honor of my father. He said, well, that's a good name. It's an ancient Russian name. And he pointed out to the icon of St. Vladimir in the cathedral and said, this will be your icon. In a later interview, he stated, as regards to wearing a cross, earlier I never had it. Once my mother gave it to me when I visited Israel. I was there two times, first on the inv official invitation of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of that country. The second time, I liked the country and I traveled there with my family as a tourist. So my mother gave it to me to have a blessing there at the tomb of our Lord. I did so, and now it is with me always." End quote. Well, this gives insight into Putin's personal religious fervor. Putin visibly reunited church and state, resurrecting the Orthodox Church in Russia to a position of power and prestige. The Russian Orthodox Church publicly endorsed Putin's leadership with televised blessings following his inauguration at the Kremlin Cathedral, reminiscent of the ascension of the Tsars to the throne. Putin has been deliberately televised celebrating Christmas and Easter Mass at the Kremlin Cathedral, participating in services, lighting candles, kissing icons, and crossing himself after the manner of the Orthodox fashion. The parallels between Putin and the Emperor Justinian are striking. Writing in Elpis Israel back in 1848, John Thomas noted, Justinian, says Gibbon, sympathized with his subjects in their superstitious reverence for living and departed saints. His code, more especially his novels, confirm and enlarge the privileges of the clergy, and in every dispute between monk and layman, the partial judge was inclined to pronounce that truth and innocence are always on the side of the church. In his public and private devotions, he was assiduous and exemplary. In prayers, vigils, and fasts displayed the austere penance of a monk. His fancy was amused by the hope or belief of personal inspiration. He had secured the patron patronage of the Virgin and St. Michael the Archangel, and his recovery from a dangerous disease was ascribed to the miraculous successor of the Holy Martyrs, Cosmos and Dam Damien. 
Among the titles of imperial greatness, the name of Pius was most pleasing to his ears. To promote the temporal and spiritual interests of the Greco-Roman Church was the serious business of his life, and the duty of the father of his country was often sacrificed through that of defender of the faith. End quote. It is also interesting to see Justinian's role as champion of the church. John Thomas noted in Alpha's Israel, page 364, Never prince did meddle so much with that concerns the affairs of the church, nor make so many constitutions and laws upon the subject. He was persuaded that it was the duty of an emperor, and for the good of the state to have particular care of the church, to defend its faith, to regulate external discipline, and to employ the civil laws and the temporal power to preserve it in order and peace. End quote. Now consider Putin's growing role as defender of Christianity. The Catholic Herald published an article in December of 2015 under the title Vladimir Putin's Holy War, which stated, Russian documentaries extol Putin as the man who resuscitated Roman sp or Russian spirituality. Kirill I, or Patriarch of Moscow and head of the Russian Orthodox Church, has described his leadership as a miracle from God. Ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russian state has carefully nurtured its relation with the Church. Putin especially is not only a powerful political actor, but like the Tsars, a religious one. In his speeches, he presents himself as defender of Christian values, abandoned by the degenerate West. More recently, the president has presented himself in a new role and as the potential savior of Middle Eastern Christians, and even his critics wonder whether he may, in fact, have a point, end quote. Well, Putin is perhaps the most visibly Christian leader in the world. In an article in the Russian Insider from October of 2014, we read, The Kremlin is both the political and historical center, not just of Moscow, but Russia. By calling for the restoration of these Christian buildings, Putin repudiates the Soviet legacy, which or with its atheistic ideology and its record of anti-Christianity, and reaffirms orthodoxy as the, as the heart of Russian culture. In his own words, here is the idea to restore the historic appearance of the place with two monasteries and a church, but giving them, considering today's realities, an exclusively cultural character." End quote. Well, it's interesting that the great-granddaughter of Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev reflected in an article this past Friday. Relations between Russia and the Holy See took on new significance after Putin became president. Unlike the officially atheist Soviets, Putin works closely with the Orthodox Church, championing conservative social values at home and seeking to expand Russian influence abroad goes on to state that, after all, Putin and Kirill have presided over rising anti-Western animosity and turned the Russian Orthodox Church towards conservatism, nationalism, and intolerance. The patriarch, rumored to have served in the KGB himself, has called the war in Syria a holy struggle, adding that today our country is perhaps the most effective or active force in the world to combat it. Well, this is, is, is of great significance. You see, years ago, Christadelphian Bible students anticipated the events we are seeing going on today by a careful reading of the Bible. Writing in the book Exposition of Daniel in the 1860s, John Thomas stated, This far, the revision of the ram and the goat was for the purpose of introducing the Roman power in its relation to Judah and the Holy Land to special notice. By the absorption of the northern kingdom into the Roman Empire, a union was formed between the Greco-Babylonian power of the Seleucidae, so that as these were heirs of Alexander's empire of Babylon, the Romans inherited it from them. Hence the power peculiar to this territory styled the whole earth may ve very properly be called the Romano-Greek Babylonian or Latin Greek Babylonian. This name is descriptive of its relation to the Holy Land in all its future phases until its utter destruction by the Messiah, the Prince, and the Holy Ones. End quote. Well, the development of the image empire through its phases would bring Babylonian, Greco, and Roman powers together under Russia. Thomas continues, 
When the Latins and Greeks come to form a confederacy under Russia as the fragile medium of combination, the Latino-Greek Babylonian power will be in full blossom when the sour grape is ripening for the vintage, end quote. Well, all this imagery is united for the great invasion described in the Bible. He continues, in the vision of the ram and the goat, the Babylonian power is its Roman manifestation, in manifestation by the little horn of the goat, which is not to be confounded with the little horn with eyes and a mouth. At the time of the end, the powers signified by these are confederated with the, horns, little, with the goat's little horn, and with it, as their chief, invade the Holy Land and besiege Jerusalem and take it. End quote. So John Thomas believed he was living close to the time when this union would happen, a union that would eventually result in the invasion of the land. In 1848, he wrote in Elpis Israel, But the time is at hand when the dominion, divided between the dragon and the beast, will be reunited, and the old Roman territory, with an immense addition of domain, again subject to one sovereign. This may be by the fall of the two-horned beast and the expulsion of the Turks from Constantinople, which will then become the throne of dominion represented by Nebuchadnezzar's image, which is to be broken to pieces in the latter days. The establishment of this sovereignty being accomplished, it stands upon the earth as the accuser and adversary of God's people Israel, and will make war upon them, and will combat with the faithful and true ones and his saints. Page 92 of Elpis Israel. Well, based on reading the scriptures and the writings of Thomas and others, Graham Pierce, in his book entitled The Vatican and the Invasion in Israel, written in February of 1970, stated, So we can expect there will develop something like a restoration of the old Roman Empire as it existed at the time of Justinian. Justinian, ruling from Constantinople, sought to control Western Europe through cooperation with the Bishop of Rome recognizing him as the head of Christianity for the whole of the Roman world. Previous to this, there had been a division between East and West. We have described the coming Roman world as a Christian socialist state, corresponding with the iron and clay feet of the image, and with the current socialist development in the society in Europe. He continues, in the light of the prophetic word, we may expect there to be a deal between the Vatican and Russia. Well, what we saw take place this week in Cuba was a significant shift towards the realization of Thomas's and Pierce's words, and more importantly, the vision painted by the prophets that has been taking place. The crusade is being prepared. The mighty men of war are being awakened, and it is being sanctified by the religious powers of the world. This is the kind of invasion that Joel wrote about. He said in Joel chapter 3, verse 9, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Well, the word prepare is the Hebrew word kadash, meaning to sanctify, consecrate, or to make holy. This tells us the latter day invasion of the land will be holy war. The preparations are being made for this today. Graham Pierce wrote in 1970, we have proposed that a future reason for the invasion of the land is that it represents a crusade. By the time the invasion takes place, the great issues will have developed in the world. Babylon the Great versus Zion. The great issue of the apocalypse through the centuries coming to a head. At this time will be revealed two headships. The day star of Babylon, Isaiah 14, and the day star of Israel, Revelation 22. And they join issue in the land of Israel, contending for rulership of the world. So the European Confederacy comes as a Christian crusade against the Jewish development in the land of Israel. He continues, the things of Zion concern religion, and it is unmistakable that there will be a religious element in the invasion of the land. It is a Christian crusade against the Jews and their religion. By the time the people of the land have or will have progressed in faith, having been under divine instruction, Christ and the saints being in the earth, and there will be something distinctly of Zion in the land of Israel, provoking the Christian crusade. 
The events we are seeing taking place today are of monumental significance, unparalleled in some areas for a thousand years. A modern-day Emperor Justinian is found in Putin, reviving the religion of Russia, building churches, championing Christianity's cause as defender of the faith. The Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches are coming together after a schism of a thousand years in joint purpose to promote religious action in the Middle East, and both look to Putin as their champion. The image is being melded together, and the legs are walking in unison, looking to march towards the Middle East. Will Putin be the man? Well, we cannot tell, but be it him or his successor, all the pieces are rapidly falling into place. We must be motivated to put our lives in order, for our Lord is surely at the door and knocking ever so loudly. For the Bible and the News, this has been Jonathan Bowen joining you.